Father, we love you, God. We thank you for this day. We thank you, God, that you've brought us together in that mighty and matchless name of Yeshua. God, we're so grateful that you love us and that you sent your son to die in our place. And God, as we've been going through this study about your people, the chosen people, Israel, Lord, we know that your heart is for them. We know that your love is steadfast for them. God, we know that you haven't cast them off as many people uh, do believe. Lord, your word makes it very clear that you're very pro-Israel, and Israel's end is a good end. So, Lord, I, I know that's all in our study today. I know we're going to cover it. And, Lord, I just pray that you would fill me, God, with your spirit. You would speak through me. I, I don't want these folks to hear my word. But, Lord, we're here to, to hear what your word has to say concerning the children of Israel, the promise that you've made to Abraham that's passed down through the generations to his offspring. And so, God, would you please, Lord, fill us all with your spirit. Please lead us and guide us in all that is said here today. Lord, we pray for Israel. You've told us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray, God, for the peace of Jerusalem. God, we pray that you would give uh, all of Israel wisdom, discernment, understanding in, the, in what is going on there. God, I pray that they would not trust in their own military might and their prowess, and they would not trust in the United States or some of these other nations that are standing with them. God, I pray that their hope and their trust would be completely in you. God, I know one day it's going to turn completely to you because your word tells us that all nations eventually are going to come against Israel. And Lord, Lord when that happens, you're going to rise up on their behalf and you're going to do a mighty work that is going to have the end result of everyone knowing that you are the Lord. So we thank you, God, for what you've done, what you're doing. We thank you for this study. Lord, please be glorified in it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Now, there are some nations that have been standing with Israel in this recent barrage of attack from Iran. Britain is one. France is another. France, I don't think they put any... Uh, any action out there in the sense of trying to knock down some of these missiles that were coming in. But Britain knocked some down. Of course, America knocked some down. Jordan knocked some down. And this is kind of surprising because Jordan, for the most part, is anti-Israel. But we have American-made interceptors in Jordan. And it's believed that those interceptors are the ones that were used to knock down <clears throat> some of the missiles that were coming over Jordanian airspace. Now the Jordanians are saying the reason that they were knocked down out of our airspace is because we don't want anybody flying through our airspace. You can tell they're kind of trying to cover their, their butts, so to speak, because they don't want Iran attacking, attacking them. So, and of course Israel, they knocked, down, they knocked down a lot. So, I mean, we all know President Biden, you know, he's like pro-Israel and he's also against Israel. <laughs> This guy, he's so, he's so unpredictable. But I'll tell you what, he's our president. We need to be praying for him. Um, he has stood with Israel to some extent, and I'm really grateful for that because we're going to see in the study today that part of this uh, promise is that God had said he will bless those who bless Abraham, which, of course, you're going to see that it goes to Jacob, to Israel, and he would curse those who will curse him. So these nations that I mentioned here, you know, they're kind of standing in a place where they are in a good place. They're going to receive a blessing from the Lord. So this is important to remember uh, as we go into this study. But before we do, like I always like to do, I want to do a little review of the last study. Now, last study, we looked at why did God choose Israel? Real simple, real quick, because he loves them and he'll keep his word. Real simple, real understandable, very scriptural. God loves Israel and he will keep his word, the promises that he made to Israel. We also see he uses Israel or he chose Israel, however you want to see it, to show his existence, his power and his glory to the world. And all we really looked at was the Red Sea, but you can really see it through many, many places in the Bible. The Red Sea, to me, honestly, is like finding Noah's Ark. It is, such a, it is such an undeniable proof that God did what he said he would do. 
And in that movie, I don't think I mentioned it last week, but I'll mention it now. It's called uh, The Exodus Revealed Search for the Red Sea Crossing. So it is just a great documentary. It is made so very, very well. They take the biblical narrative and they follow it from the land of Israel to the land of Goshen, out of Goshen, and they trace where they went and they came up with uh, that beach that was right there at Pihahi Road. Um, and then they started to dive. You know, the crossing point right there, as we said, it comes up. You, can, you could cross there. It actually is over 200 feet deep. So, you know, the Bible says the water was a wall on the right and on the left to them. You know, it just fits perfect. It's eight miles across, and there's debris all the way across the floor. Now, the coral has to grow to something, all kinds of coral outcroppings all the way across. Some of that stuff looks so, so convincing that it's definitely part of ruined chariots. <laughs> I wonder if that could be the place they cross. Well, of course it is. You know, you got to check your brains at the door to, to just leave that one off. So we looked at that last week. And again, that's online. If you missed it, you want to go back and see it. Um, and then the third one we looked at is he used Israel. He chose and used Israel to be his mouthpiece to the world. And of course, the Bible that we hold in our hands is written by 99% Jewish people, okay? So God took the Jewish people and he used them to speak his word to the world. And as he did, part of that word that he gave to the world contains prophecy. And this to me is so very, very important because God, when he uses prophecy, he says, you know what? I am God. There is none other. I'm declaring the end from the beginning that you might know that I am God. So he uses it as a way to prove that the Bible we hold in our hands, the written word of God, is in fact his word and not the word of man. So this is so important because a lot of people believe that the Bible is just a, a concoction of man. No, God used men to write his word through them and they were Jewish men moved by the Holy Spirit that he spoke through and he revealed to the world his existence through this gift of prophecy. It's, it is so, so amazing. So don't forget about that. You know, just on this thought, I'll say this real quick. I was watching a, uh, I guess he was like a, one of the Muslim, Muslim teachers. I don't know how you would term him an Amman or something like that, but anyway, I, I watched what he had to say because it was on the question, does the Quran have prophecy in it concerning Israel or just prophecy? So of course, I wanted to see. When I listened to this guy, this guy was very well mannered. He was very well educated. He was a really good speaker. He's the type of speaker that you could probably just sit there and listen to him for a while. He was very good at what he was doing. But his answer to that question, was as far as the Quran goes and prophecy in the Quran, he says there's just too many interpretations. You know, this guy will say that, this, you know, basically this is what he was saying. It's too ambiguous. You can't really come to any solid conclusion. And then he made the statement that no prophecy that's in the Quran is 100% accurate. And I'm like, bro, that's all I need to hear. Because our Bible, the Word of God, is 100% accurate or it's not the word of God, right? Amen. So this is just so important. Uh, when it comes to prophecy, the writing that we have called the Bible, the writing they have called the Quran, they're exalting the Quran, we're exalting the Bible, but God's word stands true by many undeniable, infallible proofs, and one of them is prophecy. Very important to remember that. And then the last one, that I mentioned last week was to show his divine protection over Israel. And you probably remember, we looked at just a few uh, examples. We looked at the, the Independence War in 1948, how God protected them. We looked at the 67 Six Day War. And then we looked at the Yom Kippur War, where God showed up in a miraculous way and he delivered his people. So that was last week. Now we're coming today to the promise or the promises that God has made concerning Israel. This was made to Abraham. A couple of things mentioned here we have already covered, but let me read the scripture and then we'll move on into it. 
Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now, as I said, there's some things we've already covered. We covered the land. Just as a reminder, the land was given to the children of Israel, and it's from the Euphrates River to the river of Egypt. That was the land covenanted to Abraham by an unconditional, everlasting covenant. So Israel has some room to expand. If we can get a man in there that wants to stand on the word, he can go take some more land. And they're always contesting the land over there, saying it belongs to us, the Arabs and uh, the Palestinians, the children of Esau fighting against the children of Jacob is basically what you're seeing over there. But the land has been given by unconditional, everlasting covenant to Abraham, passed to Isaac, passed to Jacob, who is Israel. Undeniably, we've already covered this. The Bible makes that very, very clear. The next thing we talked about is the great nation. And this we're going to look at just uh, a little bit because the nation is the people. I called it the people. God was going to make of Abraham a great nation. But let's not forget about Ishmael. Ishmael had 12 princes. I think we looked at that when we covered the people. And God said to Ishmael that he was going to make of him a great nation. And this is kind of where the Arab population goes. They say, yeah, we, we believe in Abraham and we're children of, of Ishmael. Matter of fact, in the Quran, you know how it goes? It goes Abraham, Ishmael, Muhammad. That's how it goes in the Quran. That's how they see it. But the Bible tells us that it goes Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and that's to the 12 patriarchs. So in between uh, Abraham and Isaac was Ishmael. In between Isaac and up to Jacob, we had a twin boy named Esau born. And God said, no, it's going to Jacob. So we covered all of this. And you can see the scripture there in Genesis 17, 20, where God had promised that he would make Ishmael a great nation. Then also Esau, as I mentioned, Esau, Esau, he had five sons, but he had a lot of grandsons. We know that Amalek came from him. Notice what it says. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren and the Lord was entreated of him and Rebekah his wife conceived so Rebekah couldn't have kids Isaac goes and prays to the Lord God hears his prayer opens his wife's womb she conceives and then the children struggled together within her and she said if it be so why am I thus and I this is why I love the King James Version in other words what the heck is going wrong with me? If everything's okay, what's going down inside there? You know, I just like the way that they, they word it. You know, we talk about the King James Version. I use it a lot. I love the New King James. I like some of the other versions, but you know how old you have to be to understand the King James Version? They did a study to see what academic level you need to be at to really understand the original King James Version. What do you think? Sixth grade. Anybody here get past the sixth grade? <laughs> if you can't understand the King James Version of the Bible, I think you need to read it a little more. Maybe go back to school. I don't know. I love it. I just love the way it's worded. So there's something going on there. And she's like, man, if, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, there's two nations in your womb. And two manner of people shall be uh, shall be separated from thy bowels and the one people shall be stronger than the other people and the elder shall serve the younger. So we see that God in divine sovereign election he chose the younger who was Jacob to be over the firstborn Esau. We talked about this Esau he despised his birthright he despised spiritual things. Jacob even though he might have had a rough start in his life as he grew he found himself wrestling with God and then prevailing with God and not willing to let God go until he blessed me. God, I ain't letting you go. And you can see why God chose him because 
That's the heart that you and I need to have. That heart that just says, God, I'm never letting you go. I know you're going to bless me, God. I'm going to stick with you. I don't care what comes my way. I am not letting you go. And that's the heart that God wants to develop in you and me. And then also we saw Abraham, and this is something that is actually often overlooked. So Abraham, after the death of Sarah, he marries Keturah, and he has six sons with her. See there in Genesis 25. Then again, Abram, Abraham took a wife, and her name was Keturah, and she bare him Zimram and Jokshan and Medan and Midian and Ishbak and Shua. So Abraham, you know, how old is the guy at this point? 125? I don't know. You know, and he's getting married again, and he's having kids. Now, all of these children, all of these children were sent away, as you see here. It says, And Abraham gave all he had unto Isaac, but unto the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had. Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac his son, while he yet lived east, uh, while he yet lived, he sent them away eastward unto the east country. So Saudi Arabia, Yemen, that, that whole area, they all go that way and they populate that whole area. And there's a lot of intermarrying with Egypt and, and these sons of Abraham. So you have a lot of different people together. But Israel, they pretty much stuck together. They did intermingle and intermarry. But they were very careful to try to stay uh, within the confines that God had set up for them. Matter of fact, Israel, I think, as I've already said, they, they went out of the land, as God said. They've been out of the land almost 2,000 years. God brought them back into the land. They retained their ethnicity. They retained their, uh, their language, Hebrew. And, of course, just being gone so long and retaining all that and coming back, it's a miracle of God. It's never happened before in history. One of my favorite uh, Bible teachers used to say, I can prove the existence of God with one word, Jew. And it's all tied into that thought right there. God chose them. God's got his hand on them. God has done things in and through them that no, no other nation or people have gone through. So the next thing we come to now in this blessing, in this promise, he says to Abraham, thou shalt be a blessing. So God said he would give Abraham a great name and he would be a blessing. Now, honestly, I cannot think of a greater gift that God could bestow upon a man or a woman than God would say to you, you're going to be a blessing. Rob, you're going to be a blessing. You know, <laughs> Mark, you're going to be a blessing. You know, what a gift that God has given to this man. And you think about it, Abraham was the one that was down in the heart of the earth after he had died, and the dead, they would go down to him, the righteous dead. And his job there was to comfort the righteous dead that the Messiah is going to come and he's going to get us out of here. I don't want to speak a lot on this because I'll, I'll spend the rest of our time right there. But Abraham was a blessing because he was a source of comfort. He was a source of God's work in the life of a man that God called him his friend. What, a, what a, an honor that God would say that to him. All right. And next we see uh, Abraham would be a blessing to some and a curse to others. And it's all predicated on their relationship with him. That's what he said. God said, I will bless him, who, those who bless Abraham, and I will curse those who curse him. So then the question might come up, now was this just to Abraham? Or did it actually pass on to Isaac and then on to Jacob? So, you know, I'm glad you asked that question because it's actually in the Word of God and we're going to look at it. And it's right here. <clears throat> and it's, it, it's from a, <clears throat> pardon me, it's from a place that you might feel a little offended at because it's something that Balaam, the terrible prophet, spoke. But what you're going to see is that this man Balaam, even though he had a terrible end and he was in opposition to God's people at the end, he was also a man that God spoke through him. What's it say here? And the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth. So who's speaking? Balaam or the Lord? The Lord. The Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, 
Return unto Balak, that's the king of Moab, and thus shalt thou speak. So God is filling him and speaking through him. You probably know the story. It's the story of the talking donkey and all of that. So I won't get into that. There's another scripture there in Numbers. It says, And Balaam lifted up his eyes, and he saw Israel abiding in his tent. So he's up above. He can see Israel down below. They're abiding in their tents, uh, or in, uh, according to their, in their tents and according to their tribes. And the Spirit of God came upon him. The Spirit of God came upon him, and he spoke. He was hired, as I'm sure you know or you should know, to curse Israel. We're talking about those that curse Israel are going to be cursed, and those that bless Israel are going to be blessed. And so he's hired to curse them, and when the Spirit of God comes upon him, he can't curse them, because it's God speaking through him. And he took up his parable and he said, we're going to see some more scriptures uh, concerning what's happened here in, in Numbers uh, as we go. So two times we see in Numbers in this story that God actually spoke through Balaam, this prophet, that we can have a hard time with him. So um, God, brings, um, God brings him out. Here's another one in Numbers, and he's speaking about Israel, and this is part of Balaam speaking. God brings him out of Egypt, that's Israel. He has strength like a wild ox. He shall consume the nations, his enemies. He shall break their bones and pierce them with his arrows. He bows down, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion who shall rouse him. Blessed is he who blesses you, and cursed is he who curses you. Who's he speaking to? Israel. Abraham? No. The children of Israel. Jacob, whom he sees in their tents and in their dwelling places, and he's paid to curse them, but he blesses them. And part of that is, blessed is he who blesses you, Israel, and cursed is he who curses you. You know, throughout history, we've seen this play out, and I know we can all say amen to that. We've seen people attack the Jewish people and hurt the Jewish people, and the end of those people has been a curse. It hasn't been good. And Israel's gone through some difficult times, but they are always coming back. God is always using them to show forth his existence, his power, and his glory. Now, here's an example, and we, like I said, we covered these last week. But I'll just mention it again real quickly. The War of Independence. Israel was attacked by Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, fighters from Yemen, Yemen, Sudan, Saudi Arabia, and Morocco. So and this is called the War of Independence. They made a UN mandate that they were going to have. I didn't write the number down. It's easy to, to find it. But basically, they were going to have a Palestinian state and an Israeli state. Britain pulled out, the United Nations made this mandate, and so Israel was like, okay, we're good, we're going to have some land, and the, and the Palestinians, the Arabs, what they do? The very next day, they attacked Israel. The very next day, they hit them with everything that they had. So Israel, even though they were greatly outnumbered, they gained one-fifth more territory than the United Nations mandate had allowed to them. So, of course, they gained more territory. They were blessed even more than they expected. Now, at the end of that war, um, Egypt retained the Gaza, and Jordan retained Samaria that we know as the West Bank. But Jordan used to have it all the way out to the Mediterranean Sea. So at that independence war, Israel gains one-fifth more territory than was mandated to them. The Six-Day War in June, 5th of 67, you probably remember, uh, Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Saudi Arabia uh, were preemptively struck by Israel for surrounding them. So, you know, all the nations came around Israel and they said, well, let's not wait, let's just hit them because we know they're going to hit us. Let's hit them first. Six days later, the war was over. And I mentioned this, this uh, quote from Nasser, Egyptian president at the time, he said, our basic goal is the destruction of Israel. Now, obviously, he doesn't believe in the Bible. In other words, he'd have a problem saying something like that because Israel's not going to be destroyed, bro. They're going to live on forever, and the Bible makes that clear. Um, 
And the last one we looked at, well, six days later the war was over. Israel gained the Sinai Peninsula, Samaria, which is the West Bank, and Gaza, and the Golan Heights. So in six days they gained so much more territory in six short days. But the most important point is that Jerusalem now came under Israeli sovereignty. They had the Temple Mount back. So they've got the Temple Mount back, all of East Jerusalem. They've got it all all the way out to the Jordan River now. They got the Golan up in the north, they got Gaza down in the south, and the history that is there is just crazy. I wish they would have wiped out the Dome of the Rock Mosque then, but obviously they didn't do that, and God knew, and God's got a purpose in it. It's still there. I was actually hoping last night one of those drones or something would accidentally hit the Dome of the Rock Mosque and, <laughs> and blow it up, you know? But anyway, God is, is definitely in control, and he's going to use that and Jerusalem to bring about this final battle. Actually, that's going to be our last study in this course, is Jerusalem the final battle? We're going to look at that. But before we do, we're going to do preterism, and that'll be next week we're going to cover uh, preterism. So anyway, we're continuing this thought of the blessing and the curse. The, the third thing was the Yom Kippur War on October 6th of 73, Syria and Egypt, so they had a north and south attack. You had 100,000 Egyptian soldiers from the south, over 1,000 Syrian tanks from the north, and that grew to be about 1,400. But the war ended almost three weeks later. Israel had to advance to within 62 miles of Cairo. I don't know if you've seen Cairo down on the map, it's way down there in Egypt. And they were all the way up close to Damascus. They were shelling Damascus when this uh, peace agreement was made. So there are just so many more examples of what of God's divine interaction on behalf of Israel. We're seeing them unfold, obviously, right now before us, before our very eyes. So we just kind of keep an eye on what's going on. We don't know if Israel's going to hit back or run. I think they are. It's sad that our president is saying, you know, basically, if you do, we're not going to stand with you uh, in that attack. But, you know, Israel's going to do what Israel does. And I don't know if they will or won't. I kind of expect that they will. But on the other hand, I think that they're so concerned about their relationship with the United States and some of these other countries that they have let that dictate their policy. Their policy should be real simple. The fear of man brings a snare. But he who trusts in the Lord shall be saved. And, th and throughout history, Israel and I'm sure many other nations make the mistake when you're overwhelmed, when you're outnumbered, when it looks hopeless, what do you do? Well, we call on our big brother, somebody bigger to come alongside us and save us. Israel has done this all the way through their history. And again, I'm sure other nations do that too. But see, God is their creator. He's their founder. He's their strength. He's their stay. He's their everything. And the Bible makes it so clear that God has showed up in such a huge way as he has protected Israel over the years. And I cannot help but think that God is just looking for them to stand up and say, God, we can't do it. The Bible makes it pretty clear that in the end, all the nations are coming against Israel. They're going to be overwhelmed. And it's going to be at that time when God is going to show up. You can read about that battle in Ezekiel 38. And 39, we know it as the Battle of Gog and Magog. It might be a lot closer than we think. But in that battle, it is God who is going to rise up and enter into judgment. He's going to rain fire and brimstone out of the sky and, and wipe out his enemies. And the Bible says over and over and over, and then they shall know that I am the Lord. It's not so much that, you know, there's going to be this great nuclear exchange and you know, somebody pushed a lot of buttons. No, this was God showed up and he did what he said he was going to do. Just that simple. It's going to happen. God said it and we can believe it. All right, so I kind of ended this whole thought with this thought. All nations beware. In Zechariah chapter 2, verse 8, probably a familiar scripture with you. Um, they're in Babylon. They're in captivity and Zechariah and Nehemiah and Ezra and them are coming out to rebuild the temple. Zechariah is such a great book. Probably when Zechariah wrote this, he's in Israel. But God tells him this scripture right here. For he who touches you, speaking of Israel, touches the apple of his eye. 
So Israel is that important, that close to God. It's like sticking your finger in the eye of God. You don't want to do that. So those who bless Israel will be blessed. Those who curse them will be cursed according to his word. Now the, the last thing that we come to here is that the Messiah will come from Abraham. Now it says there, uh, it, it said in our original scripture that God was going to uh, bless all the families of the earth through Abraham. The only way that could happen is it's a, an insinuation, an implication that the Messiah is going to come from the descendant of Abraham, which would be Isaac, Jacob, and we know that from Jacob it passed to Judah. And this is how we know that it passed to Judah, this promise of the Messiah coming. He says in, and this is, this is Jacob blessing his kids on his deathbed, telling them what will befall them in their last days, as it says in Genesis 49. He says, Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down, he lies down as a lion and as a lion who shall rouse him. The scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Now, this obviously refers uh, to the Messiah. Uh, even the Jewish people know that the scepter and the lawgiver, it literally is just signifying a ruling body, but it's, it's personified. The word Shiloh or Shiloh, some people say, actually is a reference to the Hebrew word peace. So the, the ruler of peace is going to come, and to him shall be the obedience of all the people. So it's very clearly, at least in the Jewish mindset, and hopefully in the church, that this is a reference to the Messiah that's going to come. And what's interesting is that there's some things that cannot happen listed here until the Messiah comes. And Pastor Chuck picks this up real good, and I know we're kind of running out of time, so I'm going to try to go quick. But Pastor Chuck, he says, we see here a beautiful prophecy concerning Judah. This was the tribe that his, the brothers would praise. This did not happen for several hundred years until David finally ascended the throne. But when David ascended the throne, Judah became the dominant tribe, and he remained the dominant tribe. So shortly after that, if you read about uh, David wanting to build the temple and, and God speaking to David saying you can't build me a house you're a man of war your son's going to build me a house but this is what I'm going to do for you and he basically makes a promise here and uh, of course there's a lot to be said but for time's sake he says in your house God speaking to David and your kingdom shall be established forever before you your throne shall be established forever and so this is a direct reference that the Messiah would come through King David. So what's that got to do with the scepter and all of that? Okay, well, listen to what Chuck says. Pastor Chuck says, now another interesting thing is that in AD 70, the scepter was taken and there was no longer a lawgiver, which means that the Messiah had to come sometime before 70 AD or the word of God did indeed fail. If Jesus was not the promised Messiah of Israel, there is none. There is, there is to be none, because here God's word plain, plainly declares that the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until the Messiah, the Shiloh, the peace, has come. The Messiah is either Jesus or no one. This is Pastor Chuck. Now, in the days of Jesus, I think it was in 6 AD, the Romans had taken away the Jews' right to capital punishment, and they saw that as God's word failing because, you know, the scepter and the lawgiver would not depart from the tribe of Judah until the Messiah came. And when Rome took away their right to capital punishment, they saw that as God breaking his word out of the scripture we read in Genesis 49. Pastor Chuck even shares about that, that there were rabbis supposedly had sackcloth on, dust, they were weeping, God hates us so bad, he cast us off, he rejected us, he broke his word. But they didn't realize up in Nazareth there was this little boy, probably eight years old, seven, eight years old, named Yeshua, who had been born, who is the Messiah. 
such a such an amazing story. So anyway, we get, we need to end. The Messiah will definitely come from uh, Abraham, and I brought us back here to Numbers to another thing that is spoken here, spoken here from Balaam. It's another interesting prophecy about Israel and the Messiah rising out of Jacob. It says, I see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Tumul, and Edom shall be a possession. Seir, that's, that's Edom, that's part of Edom, uh, also shall be a possession for his enemies, and is, Israel shall do valiantly, out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion, and he shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. Now this prophecy was Balaam's last that he spoke, and it concerned Israel in their latter days, in their last days. God basically said, I'm going to judge uh, Moab, I'm going to judge Edom. He even goes on in that prophecy, it's not listed here, that he's going to judge Amalek. Amalek comes into the picture in that. Important. Now this is our last scripture, um, and I want you to consider this. This again is from Numbers. It's something that... Uh, uh, Balaam said, he wrote, Balak the king of Moab has brought me from Aram, uh, from the mountains of the east. Come curse Jacob for me and come denounce Israel. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? And how shall I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? For from the top of the rocks I see him and from the hills I behold him there, a people dwelling alone not reckoning itself among the nations, who can count the dust of Jacob or number one-fourth of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous and let my end be like his. Now, if God is speaking through, Je uh, through Balaam and he's speaking concerning the children of Israel, which he is, by the way, why in the world would it end with this phrase, let me die the death of the righteous and let my end be like Israel's end? What does that do to the people that are into replacement theology that think God is completely done with Israel? He cast them off. Remember Martin Luther? God's done with them. They're no longer his people. He's no longer their God. He's done with them. Why in the world would it be written, let my end be like Israel's end if it was such a brutal end? It's so ridiculous. And this is the reason that we compare scripture with scripture. We get the whole counsel of God and we see what God says concerning any topic. When it comes to Israel, you know what? They're his special people. They're his special treasure. He's got a special purpose for them, and he's going to accomplish everything he said concerning them. Israel's in the land, and they're going nowhere. They're going to be up against the wall, and it's going to look like the end, but God's going to show up and deliver them. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, so much for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the time that you've given us together, Lord. We just pray again that you would bless Israel. We pray that you would strengthen and encourage them, that you would help them. You, we pray, God, that you would just do whatever it is you know is best for them, for us. We're your people, God. We belong to you. We're so grateful to be part of your family. And, Lord, these folks that are here, uh, that are listening, God, I just pray your abundant blessing upon them. I pray you would strengthen and encourage them. I pray, God, that you would lead us and guide us as we go. You'd make us strong in you. God, that our hearts would hunger and thirst for you alone. And that you would just use us, God, however you want in this, this day and age that we live in, Lord. I really believe it's exciting times. And whether you're coming back soon or you're coming back in a decade, doesn't really matter to me, Lord. I just know you're here. You love us. You're using us. You've got your hand upon us. And we have nothing to fear, God. We just trust you. So we thank you. For all these things in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, you know, I didn't share this one with you, but just really, really quick. Notice this scripture that Jeremiah speaks. He says, Fear thou not, O Jacob, my servant, saith the Lord, for I am with thee, for I will make a full end of all nations, whither I have driven thee, but I will not make a full end of thee, but correct thee in measure, yet I will not leave thee holy unpunished. We might have looked at this scripture in one of our past, but right here, you know what? 
He's going to make a full end of all the other nations, but not of Israel. May my end, may your end be like his. Amen. <laughs>